So throughout our discussion so far, I've talked a lot about signals being transmitted, propagated, and sent down axons. But what exactly is a signal, and how is it transmitted? If you'd like to review the organization of the nervous system or the parts of a neuron, please click here or here. The word signal in the nervous system refers to the cause of the ultimate release of neurotransmitter. Whether the signal is afferent or efferent, if the neurotransmitter is released, the signal has arrived. This signal is also known as an action potential, and the action potential is merely the excitation that travels down the axon. The function of the neuron is to transmit this signal, the excitation, from one point to another, and we now know that when the signal reaches the synapse, neurotransmitters are released from vesicles, bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, and cause the signal to continue on in the postsynaptic dendrite. So how does this excitation travel? Well, the starting point for this discussion will be the resting potential we talked about at the end of the last video, so let's go ahead and draw a nice long segment of neuron down which a signal is going to be sent. We'll call this the outside of the cell, and this the inside of the cell. Remember that we said the inside of the cell was at a potential of minus 70 millivolts, and that the inside of the cell had a really high concentration of potassium and a low concentration of sodium, whereas the extracellular environment had the opposite a low concentration of potassium, but a high concentration of sodium. Recall that this potential would influence the movement of these ions, but only if the membrane were permeable. At rest, neither of these ions could move across because it's impermeable to them. If the membrane were to somehow become permeable though, then sodium and potassium would both be able to move in the directions that we said before. Sodium wants to come in, both electrically and chemically, because it's attracted to the negatively charged inside of the cell and it's traveling down its concentration gradient, whereas potassium wants to come in electrically, but leave because of its concentration gradient pushing it out. If the membrane becomes selectively permeable, then only one ion will move at a time. The way that this selective permeability is achieved via channels. So we have a sodium channel, which we'll draw in green for the rest of this video, and we have a potassium channel, which we'll draw in orange for the rest of this video. These channels, and when they open and close, give rise to the action potential, so let's go through its stages. We'll be tracking it using this diagram here, which will allow us to track the voltage as a function of time. In the beginning, when no signal is being sent, this segment of neuron is at its resting potential of minus 70 millivolts, so we can add this as at rest. At this point, there's no sodium and potassium movement across the membrane because both channels are closed. So if we're tracking it on this diagram, we're at a resting potential of minus 70 millivolts with no change. If an action potential were to be generated upstream, positive charge would enter the cell and diffuse towards our segment of membrane. As this positive charge enters our segment, the potential inside the neuron begins to get more and more positive as more and more positive charge builds up. This is called depolarization and this depolarization can continue with no effect until it reaches about 50 millivolts or so. So if it reaches 50 millivolts right here, then we have an action potential. This level of about negative 50 millivolts, which I'll put on this diagram, is called the threshold, and it's all or none. If we reach minus 50 millivolts, if we reach the threshold, we're firing an action potential. If not, the positive charges just diffuse away and no signal is propagated and we return, like in these curves, back down to our resting potential. If minus 50 millivolts is reached, a really cool thing starts to happen. There are special sodium channels that are embedded here in the membrane that open right when we get to minus 50 millivolts. Now, because sodium is really high outside of the cell, when these channels open, sodium travels down its electrochemical gradient and begins to flood into the cell. As more and more sodium enters the cell, the potential inside the neuron gets more and more positive until it peaks at about plus 40 millivolts. So if we add this to our diagram, our voltage diagram, we see a quick upstroke to a peak of about plus 40 millivolts. Now all this sodium that's entering the cell begins to diffuse around, and if it diffuses far enough down the axon, it will open up those voltage-gated sodium channels that are present there, allowing more sodium to come in through, making the potential more positive, and so on and so forth, propagating the signal down the axon. Thus, the action potential is propagated by the entrance of sodium into the cell. So we can go ahead and draw a division here, and call this 
action potential 1 for the first phase of our action potential. At this point, the neuron wants to return to its resting potential to be able to fire another action potential should a signal come along. But the neuron also wants to keep the sodium concentration high inside the cell, at least temporarily, so that the signal can be propagated. So to get around this, the neuron involves another ion, potassium, which if you recall, is at a very high concentration inside the cell. Right about this time, the sodium channels begin to close, preventing any further sodium influx into the cell. At the same time, special potassium channels, called delayed rectifier channels, open up. At this new potential of about 40 millivolts or so, now potassium has its chance to move. The concentration gradient remains the same as before, which propels potassium out of the cell. But the electrical gradient, which before was pulling potassium into the cell, now pushes potassium out of the cell, because the inside of the cell is at a positive 40 millivolts, and since like charges repel, potassium is expelled from the cell. So now that both of these forces align with each other, the electrochemical gradient pushes potassium out of the cell. And since all of this positive charge is rushing out, this brings the potential back down towards the negative side, since all of the positive charge is leaving to the outside of the cell. And this process is called repolarization. So if we look at this on our voltage graph, it shoots down our voltage towards the resting potential and overshoots it a little bit before returning back to our resting potential of about minus 70. So now that we've moved potassium out of the cell, we can label this phase action potential 2. So now we've returned to our resting potential, but the sodium and potassium have switched places. We now have sodium inside the cell, and we have potassium outside the cell. So to flip them back to their original positions, the neuron uses a special ion channel called the sodium-potassium pump, which I'll draw here in white. And it uses energy in the form of ATP, to move three sodiums out for every two potassiums that come in. And you might see this referred to as the sodium-potassium ATPase, and this is just a fancy way of saying that it takes energy to do this. And since there are lots of these pumps present in the neuron cell membrane, the resting ion concentrations can be reset extremely quickly, and once they've been reset, the neuron can fire another action potential provided there's enough depolarization to reach threshold. Now there's a couple little wrinkles that I just quickly want to go over before we finish talking about action potentials. Until the resting concentrations are reset, the neuron may be unable to fire another action potential, and this brief time period is called the refractory period, and it's divided into two parts. In the absolute refractory period, no action potential can be fired. This is because sodium channels that were inactivated after they had opened can't reopen until the potential inside the cell hyperpolarizes beyond negative 70. So in this region right here, I'll label this with an A, this is the absolute refractory period because no sodium channels can open. The relative refractory period occurs during this period right here, right next door, and I'll label that with an R for relative because during this overshoot, there's a greater distance between here and threshold than there is between resting potential and threshold. So it takes more of a stimulus to get this action potential to fire. The other wrinkle I want to discuss is the type of activation we can get in the postsynaptic side. Like we discussed in the last video, we have a postsynaptic neuron and a presynaptic neuron. And we talked about how neurotransmitters stored in vesicles can come across here and have the signal continue on on the postsynaptic side. It turns out there's two types of signals that we could have. We can have an excitatory signal, which increases the likelihood that this signal is going to fire, or we could have an inhibitory signal, which decreases the likelihood that a signal is going to fire. And you may see these written as IPSP for inhibitory postsynaptic potential, or EPSP for excitatory postsynaptic potential. So how does this work in the brain? Well, thousands of synapses may converge onto a common dendrite so that it looks something like this, with excitatory inputs in yellow and inhibitory inputs in blue. And whether or not we get an outgoing signal depends on how much we have of each. It's in this way that thousands upon thousands of inputs can be instantly summed to cause a response that integrates the various types of input that the nervous system receives.